formed into a beat. Because I can number a line from like a man. Hi, boy. If you compact the jars, grow me school, we shall have shoulder and score in the spears. Go seek him. Tell him I will speak with him. Why, how now, Monsieur? What a life is this, that your poor friends must fool your company, what you look so merrily. A fool, a fool, I meant a fool in the forest, a motley fool, a miserable world. As I do live by food, I meant a fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he, do not call me fool from heaven out of sunny fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looked upon it with lackluster eyes as very wisely. It is ten o'clock, thus we may see, quoth he. How the world wags! This but an hour ago since it was nine, and an hour more, it will be eleven. And so, from hour to hour we write and write, and from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. When I did begin to hear him thus more on the time, my lungs began to crow like shot to clear, that fools should be so deep contemplated, and it laughs and intermission, an hour by his dial. O noble fool, O worthy fool! Motley's the only where. What fool is this? One that hath been a courtier says that if ladies be but young and fair, they have the gift to note. And in his brain, which is as dry as a remainder of biscuit after voice, he hath strange places crammed with observations, the which he vents in mangled forms. Oh, if I were only a fool. I am ambitious for a motley coat. Thou shalt have one. It is my only suit. I must have liberty. With all as large a tartar as the wind to blow on whom I please, for so fools have. They are most gowed with my bully. They most must laugh. Invest in my motley. Give me leave. Let me speak my mind, and through and through I will cleanse the body of the infected world. Would they patiently, patiently receive my medicine? Uh, spy on me, for I can tell what thou wouldst do. What for a country would I do but good? What do you come, sir? Forbear and eat no more. Why? I need not yet. Nor shall to necessity be served. Of what kind should this cock come of? Art thou a bold in man by thy distrust, or else rude despiser, but good manner? It touched my vein at first. The thorny point of fair distress hath taken for me the smooth show of civility. Yet I am inland bred and know some nurture. <coughs> But forbear, I say, he dies who touches any of this fruit. Do you not the end of reason? I must die. For <laughs> <laughs> gentleness moves to force, more than force moves us to gentleness. I almost die for food, and let ye have it. Sit down and feed you. Welcome to the table. Speak you so gently. Pardon me, I pray I thought that all things had been savage. But Whatever you are, if ever have you been where bells knelt to church, if ever have you sat in any good man's feast, if ever have you wiped a tear from your eyelid, and know what it is to pity and to be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be, in which I hope, I blush, and hide my sword. True is that we have seen better days. And said, good man's peace, and wiped her eyes, and drops of sacred pity hath engendered. But sit you down in gentleness, take upon command what help we have, that to your wanting may be ministered. Then, but forbear your food a while, whilst I go like a doe to find my fawn and give it food. There is a poor old man in the forest, who after me hath many a weary step, limped and pure love till he be first spiced, oppressed by two weak evils, from age and hunger. I will not touch a bit. Go find your mount. We will waste nothing till you return. I thank you. And be blessed for your good comfort. Seems we are not all unhappy here. In this wide and universal theater, presents more woeful pageants than the scene we play in. All the world's a stage. And all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his act being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in his nurse's arms, and then the whiny schoolboy, with satchel and shiny morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school. <laughs> and then the lover, Sighing like furnace with a woeful bell, 
made to his mistress' eyebrow. And then the soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the bard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick to quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, with fair round belly and good cape and lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth day shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for a shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again to her childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all, that which ends this strange event of history, is second childishness and mere oblivion. <laughs> sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. <laughs> Sit down your bone of burden and let him feed. I thank you most for him. I need scarce to speak to thank thee. I will not trouble you without asking what are your fortunes about. Come to my cave and tell me, good old man, what life is this? Your poor friends must rule your company. You are welcome as thy master is. Support him on the arm. Give me your hand. Let me all your fortunes understand. <laughs> 